Meet Gary Plache of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. By all accounts, a devoted father. He was emotionally devastated when his young son was kidnapped and molested by this man, the boy's karate instructor. What happened next was either justifiable or just revenge. On March 16, 1984, Jeffrey Doucet was due to face trial after kidnapping and sexually assaulting 11-year-old Jody Plache. As police were escorting the 25-year-old martial arts instructor through Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport, Jody's father, Gary Plache, sprang from his cover at a line of payphones and shot Doucet point-blank in the head. The WBRZ news station caught the entire incident on camera. A year before the shooting, the Plachés had enrolled Jody and their two younger sons in Doucette's Hapkido class. Jody was performing so well, he was eventually put on a competitive team that Doucette was forming for tournaments. After learning that the ex-Marine was living in his martial arts studio and didn't have any family close by, Gary Ploché took pity on Jeff and invited him into his home for a fresh shower, clothes, and Sunday dinner. The Plachés had taken such a liking to Doucette and his teachings that they eventually allowed him to start paying visits to their family home and taking the boys out for training exercises and other fun activities. At the time, Gary and June were beginning to go through a divorce after Gary's drinking problem put a strain on their marriage. It pained Gary having to move away from his family and only see his kids every other weekend, but he was glad they had a respectable teacher like Jeffrey Doucette to look up to. Gary Ploché himself became one of Doucette's biggest fans and used his connections with the WBRZ TV station to get Doucette airtime to showcase his martial arts class. But what Gary and his wife June didn't know was that Jeff Doucette had been sexually abusing their son. The abuse started when Jody was just 10 years old. Doucette was driving Jody home when he asked the boy if he wanted to learn to drive. Jody would sit in Doucette's lap and steer while Doucette did the stick shift. As they were driving, Doucette moved his hands onto Jody's lap multiple times. It made Jody feel uncomfortable, but he thought it might just be an accident, so he didn't say anything. Things escalated when Doucette took Jody and a group of boys from his martial arts school to a karate event in Houston, Texas. At some point during the trip, Doucette told Jody, I'm gonna suck your dick tonight. Later that night, after the rest of the kids from the martial arts school had fallen asleep in the room, Doucette turned off a John Wayne movie he had been playing and crawled under Jody's blanket to perform oral sex on the 10-year-old. This went on for about a month before Doucette told him, Okay, now I'm gonna fuck you. From this point on, Doucette began having sex with Jody after he would finish performing oral sex on him. Other times, Doucette would stop practice and send the rest of the kids to 7-Eleven for snacks. Not you, Jody, he'd add. I need to do some extra work with you. Then he would take the young boy to a room in the back. According to Jody, Doucette would sexually abuse him almost every day, sometimes twice a day. Jody knew that what his teacher was doing wasn't right, but he didn't know how to tell anyone. He also respected Jeffrey Doucette and considered him a good friend that was fun to be around. Authorities say Doucette made a habit of hanging out with his students, often offering them nights out at the skating rink or some other activity. Some of the parents had withdrawn their children from Doucette's classes because they felt he acted strangely around young boys. Jody's uncle became wary of the martial arts instructor after witnessing Doucette's strange behavior around his nephew. Jody had won first place at a karate tournament in Dallas, Texas, and the Plachés had made arrangements for Jody to stay with his uncle instead of in a hotel with Doucette. Jody's uncle claims Doucette didn't talk to anyone when he dropped Jody off and appeared to be angry that Jody wasn't staying with him. His concerns grew even more after Doucette gave Jody a goodbye kiss on the lips. Jody's uncle told Gary that something was very wrong with Doucette's relationship with Jody, but Gary stood by Doucette, despite his brother insisting he was wrong. After Gary moved out, Doucette began coming over more often. On Sunday, February 19, 1984, Doucette arrived at the Plochet residence and told Judy he wanted to show Jody some carpet he was laying. Ms. Plaché was told it would only take about an hour, but after they had not returned for several hours, June began to worry and phoned her friend who was a deputy sheriff. She also called Gary, but couldn't get a hold of him. 
The 35-year-old mother then made a four-hour drive to a relative of Doucette's to see if Jeff was there with her son. She was told that Jeff and Jody had indeed been there, but left before she had arrived. Gary had been out of state at a friend's wedding when he received June's message. He immediately made his way home, and the FBI was alerted about Jody's disappearance. Ten days later, on February 29th, June got a call from Doucette, who demanded she take the remaining boys and their school transcripts to New York so they could be together as a family. June told Doucette his plan wasn't realistic and pleaded with him to return with Jody so they could figure things out. Doucette then told her, June, listen to me. If you ever want to see Jody again, you'll meet us here. June eventually tried using a ruse concocted by police. Gary might use this to get custody of all the children if you don't bring Jody back, she said. If the court gives Gary the kids, I'll get them from him, Doucette exploded in rage. I'm tired of people saying I'm insane, and if you say I am, you'll never hear from me again. Unknown to Doucette, the FBI had been recording and tracing their phone call. After about an hour, they traced the call to a motel room in Anaheim, California. As June was talking with Doucette, their conversation was interrupted by the shouts of police officers as they began raiding Doucette's motel room. The line went dead, and June did not hear word from the police for almost an hour. Finally, they called to confirm that Jody was okay and that Doucette had been arrested. On the plane ride back to Louisiana, after a grand jury indicted Jeffrey Doucette on a charge of aggravated kidnapping, Doucette confessed to sexually assaulting many children multiple times, as well as Jody and at least two of his other students for close to a year. He also claimed that he was molested at a young age. When asked why he had kidnapped Jody, he said it was because there was a warrant out for his arrest for writing bad checks and other fraud, and he was afraid he wouldn't be able to see Jody or the Blachets again. He dyed Jody's hair black so it would be easier to pass him off as his son. He also claimed that June had planned to run away with him and the kids, but June denies these claims. Jody was given a medical exam, and after some questioning, revealed that he had voluntarily gone with Jeffrey Doucette to California. On March 1st, Jody was flown back to Louisiana to be with his family. All seemed well, and the Plachés were happy their son had returned to them unharmed. Then, 12 days later, a detective from the sheriff's office stopped by to discuss the test results of Jody's medical exam. The results showed that 11-year-old Jody Plaché had been raped. Gary and June were devastated and could not believe their son had been defiled by somebody they trusted and treated like their own family. June decided the best thing to do would be remain calm and ask Jody if this was true. Jody confessed everything to his mother and said her calm demeanor really helped to get his dark secret off his shoulders. Jody says he went outside to play and was happier than he's been in a long time. Gary Plaché, however, was beginning to go to a very dark place. The thought swirling through his head of the man he trusted using his child in unimaginable ways. The shame and embarrassment was eating Gary like a plague, so he turned to drinking to drown his sorrows. On March 16, 1984, Gary was drinking at a local bar when he overheard a conversation about Jeffrey Doucette. The bartender and somebody from the WBRZ TV station were discussing Doucette's arrival time when Gary heard the WBRZ employee say, Yeah, he's coming in at 9.08. After hearing this, Gary rushed to the airport and started downing black coffee as he watched the flight times. Gary had a 38 revolver tucked away in his right boot and disguised himself in a baseball cap and dark sunglasses as he waited patiently by the payphones. He called a friend to confess what he was about to do, and as police were approaching with Doucette, Gary said to his friend, Here he comes. You're about to hear a gunshot. Gary's friend tried to hang up and alert police, but it was too late. Gary Plaché turned from the payphones and shot Doucette from less than three feet away. Before police apprehended him, Plaché calmly hung up the payphone he had been using. Son of a bitch, why Gary, why'd you do it? shouted Mike Barnett, a sheriff's deputy that was a friend to the Plaché family. Barnett had not recognized Gary until after the shooting. If somebody did it to your kid, you'd do it too, wept Plaché as he was hauled off to jail. Jeffrey Doucette died the next day and Gary Plachet was charged with second-degree murder. A day later, Plachet was out on a $100,000 bond posted by a friend. His lawyer, Foster Sanders, then committed him to a psychiatric ward. 
The psychiatrist who examined Gary concluded he could not tell right from wrong at the time of the shooting, and that Gary thought he was hearing the voice of God telling him he had to kill Doucette to protect his son and other children. Defense lawyer Foster Sanders calls the shooting justifiable homicide and cites a psychiatrist's report describing the 39-year-old Plaché's deep depression caused by his belief that Jody was made into a sex object. Gary thought he had a divine mandate to do what he thought had to be done to protect his family, said Sanders. He had a mere image of right and wrong. He thought what he was doing was right. The Doucette family and the prosecuting attorney, however, felt that Jeffrey Doucette was being set up as a pedophile by a jealous ex-husband with connections to police. They claimed June Plaché and Jeffrey Doucette were more than just good friends, and that Doucette's death was caused by jealous rage and not the kidnapping and molestation of Jody Plaché. On May 16th, Gary Plaché took a deal from the prosecutors to plead no contest to the reduced charge of manslaughter which carried a maximum sentence of 21 years in prison. However, Judge Frank Saya felt the shooting was a tragedy with loss on both sides and concluded that Gary Plaché was not a danger to the public given the circumstances. Gary Plaché was given a seven-year suspended sentence, five years probation, and 300 hours of community service. He never served any time in prison. Doucette's brother Roland called the sentencing an outrage and doesn't believe justice was done. Jody Plaché now shares his story to others across the U.S. in an attempt to bring awareness to child abuse and how to prevent it. He says he didn't want anyone to kill Jeffrey Doucette, especially not his father, but he also understands why his father felt he had to do what he did. On October 21, 2014, Gary Plaché passed away at the age of 68 from complications caused by his second stroke in three years. Do you regret killing Jeff Doucette? No. No. Would you do it again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes.